You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Monday, the 24th of February, 2014. Dave Lee Travis to face retrial on sex offence charges. Cable urge to act on construction skills shortage. Calling someone foreign swine or filthy asylum seeker is not racist, rules Swiss court. Police clash with pillaging anarchists in western France as airport protest degenerates. Austin and his island in the sun. Three Muslims were killed with bladed weapons in the capital of the Central African Republic. Tunisia to tighten niqab controls as anti-terrorist measure. Thought for the day, facts and more unsavoury facts. And finally, Fifty Shades of What? Not for the Squeamish. UK News. Dave Lee Travis to face retrial on sex offence charges. Former Radio 1 DJ Dave Lee Travis is to face a retrial on charges of indecent and sexual assault, the Crown Prosecution Service has said. The 68-year-old from Mentmore, Buckinghamshire, was found not guilty earlier this month of 12 counts of indecent assault. However, the jury at Southwark Crown Court was unable to reach a verdict on the two outstanding charges. Speaking outside court, Mr Travis said that the nightmare is now going to go on. Appearing before Judge Anthony Leonard, Prosecutor Miranda Moore QC told the court the prosecution is seeking a retrial for two outstanding counts. The outstanding charges relate to an allegation of indecent assault against a woman in the early 1990s along with an alleged sexual assault on a journalist in 2008. Well, to date, wonder if all the victims of Muslim grooming gangs from 35 years ago can start naming and shaming and moreover get money from their abusers. Just a thought for Afsal and the CPS. Cable urged to act on construction skills shortage. Vince Cable, the business secretary, has been called on to hold a crunch summit to address the acute skills crisis in the construction industry, which has lost 400,000 jobs during the recession. A report by a cross-party group into youth unemployment and construction on Wednesday will argue that a high-level summit is the best way to encourage the industry to tackle its growing jobs shortage. As the economy improves, construction needs 180,000 more workers to build planned bridges, roads, housing and vast infrastructure projects by 2018. However, government figures show the industry started training only 13,700 apprentices in 2012-2013, down 39% from 22,400 just two years earlier. Nick Rainsford, a former Labour construction minister who is co-chair of the inquiry, told The Independent that a similar summit on the industry's safety record in 2001 overhauled attitudes in what was until then a highly dangerous profession. He hopes Mr Cable and Sir David Higgins, chairman of High Speed 2, will host the summit alongside the industry veteran James Waits, who heads construction specialist skills body. World at eight. Well, we all know that this means another 180,000 immigrants because we can't bother to train our own workers. In fact, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of our own building workers who need jobs, even if it is building houses and roads for immigrants. European News. Calling someone foreign swine or a filthy asylum seeker is not racist, rules Swiss court. The federal tribunal, examining the case of a Swiss policeman who appealed against his conviction for racial discrimination, ruled the expressions were not racist because they were widely used expressions. Well today, oh I love it, roll on the Swiss. Police clash with pillaging anarchists in western France as airport protest degenerates. Riot police have moved into the western French city of Nantes, clashing with hundreds of anarchists who broke shop windows, destroyed bus stops and pillaged the city centre. The regional prefecture says that six police officers were injured in confrontations on Saturday with up to a thousand radicals who joined an estimated 20,000 people protesting plans to build an airport in the Loire Atlantic region. Four people were detained, the prefecture said. Interior Minister Manuel Val said the delinquents were from the radicalised ultra-left and were waging an urban guerrilla campaign. Val said on iTele TV station that these individuals who are very violent. World at eight, that is the trouble with the new protesters. They are violent, well organised and have an agenda. Gone are the days of peaceful protests because entire governments can be brought down by the ensuing media lies and hype. 
Now I hand you over to Austin Davis, who today talks about his island in the sun. Hello again, and welcome back. You may recall my leaving you just down the road from Armageddon, and now it's time for me to reveal what happened next. By way of a refresher, my island had been subjected to unlimited immigration of an alien horde, hostile to the indigenous peoples. They grew in numbers to such an extent that whole districts, and then entire regions, were colonised, and the indigenous people excluded. Then the aliens were minded to take over. The country was petitioned, and the northern and eastern sectors put on a military footing and blockaded. 100,000 people of non-ethnic stock were given 24 hours notice to get out or face the consequences. They left in a train of misery and desolation and the New Islanders mocked them and spat at them even as they loaded carts and trucks with what possessions they could carry. Their money and property was forfeit, of course. Now at this stage in the tale I really should give you some good news and some bad. The good news is that I have not been speaking about Britain. The bad news is that history has a habit of replicating itself. My island, my other island, is Sri Lanka. On the map it sits as a teardrop just to the bottom right of India, 18 miles away across the Polk Straits at their narrowest point. The invading aliens were the Tamils from the South Indian state of Tamil Nadu. Tamils were shipped across from the mainland in huge numbers to work the Sri Lankan tea plantations, without any regard for the laws of unintended consequences. Now, I do appreciate that you will have been conditioned by the BBC, Channel 4 and even David Cameron to consider the Tamil people a persecuted and downtrodden minority. But if you would be kind enough just to bear with me. The indigenous people of Sri Lanka are Buddhist, Christian and Muslim in their faith, and they are extracted from peoples of Asia, Europe and the Middle East. Together they are constituent parts of the Sinhalese, that is, lion people, and it's a fascinating parallel with the Brythonic Anglo-Saxon and Nordic peoples that are the Britons. Sri Lanka is geographically small, half the size of England, but it's rich and fertile with a wealth of resources that make it an attractive option to those who dwelt in arid lands across the sea. And it was its attractiveness that nearly marked its downfall. The Tamil riots had been masterminded by one Velopillai Prabhakaran, a rabid Marxist and Tamil separatist, avid student of war and terrorism, who admired to the point of adulation Alexander the Great, Napoleon, and one Mr. A. Hitler. He founded the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam. Elam, because it's the hot historical Tamil name for Sri Lanka, and tigers, because tigers are incompatible with, and fight with, lions. Mr. Prabhakaran was an innovative sort of fellow. He was to introduce to the modern theatre such niceties as suicide bombers, human shields, and child soldiers. Children as young as five were kidnapped and indoctrinated, that is, taught to hate. The insurgency inspired and led by Prabhakaran is referred to as a civil war, but in reality it was a true war against terrorism. Prabhakaran wanted a huge chunk of the country to rule over as his own. But that was not enough. Nothing you may remember is ever enough. Prabhakaran wasn't choosy about who he killed or maimed. The attack on the military convoy, think Warren Point, 
soon after the insurgency began, took no account of the fact that most of the soldiers blown to bits that day were his own people. Likewise, the Tamil mayor of Jaffna he had murdered for failing to do as he was told, silly man, decent man as he was. The government eventually decided that they actually had a bit of a problem here and moved against the Tamil paramilitaries. But as the army tended to play by the rules and their adversaries never did, they were always at a disadvantage. The self-styled Tigers shed their battle fatigues at the first hint of force majeure and blended in with the ordinary villagers and townsfolk, a tactic they were regularly to deploy right to the end of the conflict. And they yelped for help from India whenever the tide turned against them. Despite the Tamil Tigers being an illegal terrorist organisation and despite Prabhakaran being wanted by Interpol for murder, terrorism, organised crime and conspiracy, whenever government forces were in danger of getting the upper hand, the international community and the Indian authorities in particular leapt to the defence of the oppressed minority. Prabhakaran's foul murdering regime endured for nearly 30 years and despotic murders were followed by terrorist outrages were followed by despotic murders. An initiative of obscene irony saw Prabhakaran recruit suicide bombers from amongst Buddhist communities. The perpetrators, believing in reincarnation, imagined themselves returning as someone's pampered pussy, whilst the pittance they were paid would at least feed the wife and put the kids through school. One Indian politician, an inspiring young man who was heading for the top, sent Indian troops to the island to act as peacekeepers, an Indian solution to an Indian problem. But it didn't suit Prabhakaran one bit. Nobody called the shots on his manner. The inspiring young man was Rajiv Gandhi. He was murdered by Prabhakaran's trained psychopaths in India in 1991. I could spend the rest of this broadcast detailing the horrors, the inhuman behaviour, the crimes against humanity that ensued. The suicide bombing of Sri Lanka's central bank in the capital of Colombo 91 civilians, fathers, sisters, mothers, killed. 1,400 people who put food on their families' tables mutilated. More than 100 people blinded, condemned to a life of begging on the benefit-free streets. But enough. This really is enough. A new nationalist government was swept to power by an angry and sickened electorate. A government committed to end it, whatever the cost, whatever the consequences. And they did. India squealed, the West squawked, and the blood beast Prabhakaran said, bring it on. The forces of President Mahinda Rajapaksa brought it on all right and they kept on bringing it on, despite the rising tide, the murmur of voices that became a cry of outrage, of international condemnation. Negotiate, they demanded. Rajapaksa didn't even bother to argue. The time for negotiation was past. As the Tamil Tigers were quite literally driven into the sea, Prabhakaran tried to save himself not giving a damn for the 30,000 who fell during those final days. With 12 million rupees in his luggage, he knew he could sort something out. So he offered to surrender and was shot like a dog. The land changed overnight. The following dawn was lighter, brighter somehow than it had been for a quarter of a century. And so it is still, nearly four years later. The Tamils in exile are still waging war, but a propaganda war now, 
a war of words. There are large Tamil populations in the UK, who'd have thought that, eh? The US and Canada, and they all have votes, and they all know all about pressure groups. Hence the posturing and pontifications of puerile politicians who holler human rights and war crimes at the top of their voices to a people who think that going about their daily business without being bombed, without seeing their wives raped in front of them, without having to watch as their sons are dragged away to be reprogrammed, is their human right, and one they would rather like to retain. They also believe that there are no war crimes. They believe that war itself is the crime and that this time the criminals obtain their just deserts. Incidentally, it doesn't need Stephen Hawking to work out why these people are in exile in the first place, whilst over 30 million of their brethren are content to remain on their war-free, terrorist-free, mad, despotic, murdering, fascist, dictator-free island that is the Nationalist, Democratic, Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka. And dear listener, what think you? What care you for that small island just a short strait of sea miles from the continent? What care you for that foolish people who welcomed the viper to their bosom and gave it succour? What care you for the blood of a generation spilt on the altar of appeasement that was not enough, that was never, ever enough? Those who fail to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. We close this page on the history book and walk on in fear and dread. For well we know a frightful fiend doth close behind us tread. Good night, and rest easy in your beds, for tomorrow. Austin Davis, World at Eight. Little Blighty on the Edge. Thank you, Austin. An insightful report. World News. Three Muslims were killed with bladed weapons in the capital of the Central African Republic. Three Muslims were killed with bladed weapons in the main market of Bangui, the capital of the Central African Republic, on Saturday, according to eyewitnesses. The three men were taken in a taxi to Mopoko military base near Bangui airport when the driver suddenly pulled over and informed on them to a nearby mob of Christians. They were dragged out of the cab and hacked to death with bladed weapons. The Christian mob immediately fled the scene with the arrival of the Cameroonian contingent serving as part of the African peacekeeping force, MISCA. CAR descended into anarchy in March 2013 when Salika rebels, said to be mostly Muslim, ousted Francoise Bozizi, a Christian who had become who had come to power in a 2003 coup. The rebels later installed Michel Jotodia, a Muslim, as interim president. In the months since, the country had been plagued by tit for tat sectarian violence between Christians, anti Balaka militias, and former Salika fighters. Violence against Muslims has intensified since Catherine Samba Panza, a Christian, was elected interim president in January. Machete-wielding Christian militiamen now roam the Bangui suburbs, often erecting illegal checkpoints in order to identify and lynch Muslims. A number of Muslims have recently been lynched in broad daylight and their bodies set on fire. Several mosques in Bangui too have been destroyed and scores of Muslim home lo homes looted. Christians, who constitute the majority of CAR's population, accuse Muslims of supporting former Salika rebels, blamed for attacking Christian homes, looting property and carrying out summary executions. World at Eight the striking thing about this article is that numerous news items show up in the major search engines Google, Bing and Yahoo about the Muslims killed in the Central African Republic. But you have to really dig to find the items about Christians being killed in the Sudan, Nigeria and other Islamic regions. And they say journalism is unbiased. Yeah, pull the other one. About time for a turnaround, I think. Tunisia to tighten niqab controls as anti-terrorist measure. The Tunisian Interior Ministry on February the 14th announced stricter controls on people wearing the niqab. The measure is being taken because of the threat the country faces and because of terrorist suspects using the niqab to disguise themselves and escape justice, the Interior Ministry said. 
The Ministry urged citizens to be understanding and help security units to do their work. Security forces have recently arrested a number of terrorists and criminals wearing niqabs. Authorities also pointed out that terrorists who, who were hunted down in Ruad, as well as those arrested in Ariana, moved from Jebel Shambi to the capital wearing niqabs. Obama calls homosexuality one of the USA's fundamental freedoms in statements slamming Ugandan Bill. President Barack Obama has elevated the right to have sex with a member of the same sex to the level of universal fundamental freedoms in a new presidential statement criticising Uganda. But critics say his promotion of homosexuality in a continent that overwhelmingly opposes that behaviour amounts to a form of liberal cultural imperialism. His reaction came after Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni said last Friday that after nearly two months' deliberation, he would sign legislation that makes conducting a same-sex wedding punishable with seven years in prison. Infecting others with AIDS, having sex with minors or repeated homosexual acts may earn life imprisonment. An earlier version of the bill called for the death penalty, but this provision was removed. According to a spokesman, Museveni decided to sign the bill after scientists told him there is no definitive gene responsible for homosexuality. He added that homosexual prostitution is what the president wants to prevent, especially after presidential adviser on science Dr Richard Tushimoweri said that all homosexuality had serious public health consequences. Thought for the day. Facts and more unsavoury facts. Now, it's obvious to all and sundry, unless you're either a judge, plod or whatever in the judicial system, that there is a huge black-white divide, and I mean the general divide of in between is as well, brown, yellow, tan and purple with yellow spots. In fact, anything that is not recognisably white or pink, English, Scots or Welsh, or any mixture of the same. This difference is marked only by its upward mobility through the last 25 years to now, where it seems imperative to legally forget the colour of a man's skin in one case and make it a prime target in another. There have been many cases reported in the world date and on the BNP website of black-on-white crimes which have been under-reported, under-sentenced and forgotten. All the comments from nationalists and even non-supporters of nationalism have been dismissed as racist and anti-colour or the whinings of the so-called far-right, neo-Nazis or Aryan supremacists. But when the ordinary people of this country start to remember some of these crimes and many unreported crimes of black, Asian and white, then this particular bit of misinformation from the establishment starts to reflect very badly on the judicial system. It also reflects badly on our country, because if you cannot look after your own, what chance do newcomers stand or some such self-serving ideology? The problem with the West and the UK in particular is that we approach other countries with the same sort of nanny attitude that went out with the Ark and colonialism. It is, incidentally, the same sort of nanny state with which we look after, pay for and worry about migrants. Osborne, he of the grammar school looks and council house bone structure, now says we should pay for Kiev to be rebuilt. Oh yeah? What planet is this man on? Now we will probably have to put up with thousands of refugees from sodding Kiev, along with the bloody Syrians because they've ruined their own countries. We didn't, and for once, the US didn't either. It is this peculiar communistic bon homme that defies me and really makes me hopping mad. I've just got a relative out of prison, yep, prison. He lapsed from the alcoholic path after 16 years, grabbed a knife, went and played with the traffic, but by the time the plods turned up, he was collapsed indoors and a neighbour had retrieved the knife. He spent two nights in cells and a week in prison on remand. He is, of course, white. And seeing that if you are Asian or black, you can get away with actual bodily harm, with just community service and a fine, he will be lucky to get a suspended sentence, even with no previous record. He is white, after all. He has the greatest praise for the prison officers and his legals who have been marvellous, but his respect for the police has plummeted to well below normal. Whilst on remand, he heard a story which will you find interesting. Of course, being the multicultural country we are, there was no C of E chaplain or Roman Catholic chaplain, but there was an imam. Because, of course, there were many foreigners on remand or in stir as well. This story concerns the Chinese prisoners. All inmates are given a kettle to use. The chinks apparently coerce the pigeons into their cells with food, kill them, skin them and put them in the kettles to boil to eat. Now this is just the tip of the iceberg when you get massive immigration over many years. Most of these foreigners believe that this is their country, not to fight for or defend, but to populate and control. And our justice system helps them to do this with the deportation laws subject to EU whimsies and judges who want to keep at the top of their game.
The Muslim prisoners are cocky and always plead not guilty to anything and cost the courts and you taxpayers millions of pounds a year. It costs £12,000 a day to run a Crown Court and there are more ways of killing a country than outright tanks and invasion. Now this is an interesting article and although falsely attributed to Bill Cosby, the US celeb, the sole and actual author, excluding the anonymous perpetrators of various revised versions over time, was former Massachusetts State Senator Robert A. Hall, who published the original document on his original on his personal blog on february nineteenth, two thousand and nine. I'm 83. Except for a brief period in the 50s when I was doing my national service, I've worked hard since I was 17. Except for some serious health challenges, I put in 50-hour weeks and didn't call in sick in nearly 40 years. I made a reasonable salary, but I didn't inherit my job or my income, and I worked to get where I am. Given the economy, it looks as though retirement was a bad idea. And I'm tired, very tired. I'm tired of being told that I have to spread the wealth to people who don't have my work ethic. I'm tired of being told the government will take the money I earned by force if necessary and give it to people too lazy to earn it. I'm tired of being told that Islam is a religion of peace when every day I read dozens of stories of Muslim men killing their sisters, wives and daughters for their family honour, of Muslims rioting over some slight offence, of Muslims murdering Christians and Jews because they aren't believers, of Muslims burning schools for girls, of Muslims stoning teenage rape victims to death for adultery, of Muslims mutilating the genitals of little girls, all in the name of Allah, because the Quran and Sharia law tells them to. I'm tired of being told that out of tolerance for other cultures, we must let Saudi Arabia and other Arab countries use our oil money to fund mosques and madrasa Islamic schools to preach hate in Australia, New Zealand, UK, America and Canada, while no one from these countries are allowed to fund a church, synagogue or religious school in Saudi Arabia or any other Arab country to teach love and tolerance. I'm tired of being told I must lower my living standard to fight global warming, which no one is allowed to debate. I'm tired of being told that drug addicts have a disease and I must help support and treat them and pay for the damage they do. Did a giant germ rush out of a dark alley, grab them and stuff white powder up their noses or stick a needle in their arm while they tried to fight it off? I'm tired of hearing wealthy athletes, entertainers and politicians of all parties talking about innocent mistakes, stupid mistakes or youthful mistakes when we all know they think their only mistake was getting caught. I'm tired of people with a sense of entitlement, rich or poor. I'm really tired of people who don't take responsibility for their lives and actions. I'm tired of hearing them blame the government or discrimination or big whatever for their problems. I'm also tired and fed up with seeing young men and women in their teens and early twenties bedeck themselves in tattoos and face studs, thereby making themselves unemployable and claiming money from the government. Yes, I'm tired. But I'm also glad to be 83, because mostly I'm not going to have to see the world these people are making. I'm just sorry for my grandchildren and their children. Thank God I'm on the way out and not on the way in. Now he was right, and it applies to us in the UK even more so, as we are much smaller, and now with the channel, more vulnerable to the millions of Muslims that have encroached into Europe over the last 30 years. We need to look at where society is going and act accordingly, because our governments will not. They're petrified of civil unrest, and we all know that civil unrest follows wherever Muslims and blacks primarily enrich our areas with their communities, that word of the communist ghettos. So like poor old Wiley Coyote backtracking with an acme bazooka from the ravening hordes of roadrunners and literally running out of ground, that is the UK today. This is why there are untold stories of black on white murders, tortures and rapes which have never seen the national papers, and they won't. Because even our judiciary are worried as to the state of the general public's mind over such obvious miscarriages of justice, and the fact that the ethnic problems seem to be getting more so, not less, the more leeway that is given to them, and not to us. For the most part, the indigenous peoples of this country. To say it is merely unfair is lessening their crimes and denigrating their victims. The examples are ludicrous and would only sit upright in an EU court for laughingly what is called human rights. You can take it from me that the EU not only have done away with anyone in the UK being called Indigenous, but any human rights we may have had owing to us with this title do not and cannot apply. So therefore it is open season for the inhabitants of the UK who are non-ethnic. This is why national rags are promoting an ageing population, or rather blaming the ageing population, for the long appointment lists at hospitals and GP surgeries, when in fact and truth 
It is the new immigrant populations who are taking the time of the GPs and our NHS. Fact. It is their ageing relatives, their retards, their cripples, their new babies and their genetic defects which are crippling our country, now like the foreign aid budget. And will anyone in power admit this? No, because it would lead to civil unrest. In fact, England has always had an ageing population because we used to live longer than the third world anyway. But at least this ageing population has paid into and paid for their care in the past, which is more than most, if not all, the newcomers will do for the future. All the propaganda about immigrants having to be brought in to look after our ageing population is absolute crap, as are the sentences for these people when they commit crimes. There is one law for the black and one for white, which is ridiculous in what was once mainly a Christian white country 50 years ago. Now our prisons, courts, hospitals, land and country is full to busting of strangers who only want money from us. Certainly laughable and time-wasting for a UK court is the case of a couple who cannot be named, but obviously African, who were palmed off with an African baby when they went back to Africa, that country that was obviously too awful to live in, and fell prey to a witch doctor from over here as well. Why don't they ship these idiots back to Africa? Why is it that we even allow them in? Africa wanted independence and still rails on about Arab slavery, but comes to a country that looks after and allows Arabs to still have slavery. The UK. Muslims and Arabs come over here and expect it to be home from home, and if not, they soon will make it so. And even our royalty seem to participate in the stupid acts of appearing to welcome them. I'm personally and heartily sick of reading of the light sentences that ethnics seem to receive for terrible crimes and the heavy sentences imposed for coating a mosque doorknob in pig grease or watching while some drunken idiot puts a table through a mosque door. Yup, just watching. I'm sick of reading of us in the UK providing more money for strange countries who get themselves in trouble or are starving because of Muslim factions or African tribalism or sodding waves or fire. No one has helped our people or fed our cattle or helped our farmers in our floods, so there. Foreign aid, stop it forthwith and put most of the money into sorting out immigrants and starting deportations. Our national debt would be almost solved and it would show the EU and the world that the UK can at least try to look after its own instead of a bunch of greedy foreign peasants at the feeding trough of the multicultural Marxist far-left so-called lovies. Remember that laws made in effect for the people, especially by the EU and adopted by us, are not made for this indigenous race of people or tribes in the UK, and I loosely include Scotland here, as we are all apparently ageing or useless. So they must be made for our new populations, mustn't they? Only if so, then the laws of the land should apply to all, regardless of their skin colour, but it doesn't. You can murder a man, but as long as you don't refer to his colour, you might, if black, of course, get off. And if a Muslim, then don't worry, you most certainly will. I will repeat again, a black man's behind is never fair, and neither is the application and interpretation of our laws in the UK. And finally, Fifty Shades of What? Now this is to cheer everyone up on a Monday, and to our more sensitive listeners, cover your ears. My missus bought a paper back in Asda. Saturday, I had a look inside the bag. "'Twas fifty shades of grey. "'Well, I just left her to it, see, and went off up to bed. "'An hour later she appeared. "'Oh, the sight filled me with dread. "'In her hand she held a rope, the other held a whip. "'She brandished them around a bit and then began to strip. "'Well, forty years ago I might have had a peek, "'but Doris hasn't weathered well. "'She's seventy-eight next week. "'Watching Doris bump and grind couldn't be much grimmer, "'and things progressed from bad to worse. "'She toppled off her zimmer.' She struggled back up to her feet a good half hour later, put her teeth back in and said that I must dominate her. Now if you knew our Doris C, you'd know just why I cringed. I'd been two months in traction cause my hips and knees unhinged. She stood there nude all naked like, bent forward quite a bit, and jumping back in fright, I went and stood on her left tit. Doris screamed, her teeth shot out, my word, what had I done? She moaned and groaned then shouted out, step on the other one. Well, reader, I can tell no more about what occurred that day. Suffice to say, my dark brown hair turned fifty shades of grey. Black and blue, battered too, with wanton wild perversion, we decided that a night of sin was scarce worth such exertion. Thank heavens she has binned the book, and peace reigns like before. 
She's head to toe in Winsiet and back to back. We snore. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart and I wish you all a very good night. <laughs>